We're coming out dangerous. Rockets going off. Sometimes the brightest stars shine for the shortest amount of time. Yeah, oh yeah. They heard us all across Tallahassee after that one. We gotta bring home the W. Oh yeah. We're gonna destroy them. Put them on the Heisman watch. They're fine, man. Big Ben player of the year. We're gonna be a force to be reckoned with. I played a little adult league goalie. I felt like I, I scored in the World Cup, but I didn't even score. Controversy? Question mark? Pure chaos. Go crazy was insane. Chris Petley, he was the defensive MVP of the 2019 season. Oh yeah, no, I'm in my prime right now. Let's go. Let's go. And welcome back to the Tally SC Talk podcast. Another edition in. Thanks for coming back and joining us. I am automatically going to assume everybody's binging at this point. Andrew Duke, Trent Young, bringing it to you, the voices of TSC, and of course the host of the TSC podcast, Tally SC Talk. Trent. So thanks for coming aboard, my man. Once again, ready to rock and roll this week. So for this week's episode, Going to get back at it. we got our big topics in conversation coming out of the game. Obviously fresh on the mind. But first of all, man, how are we doing and how are we feeling about the result this week, big dog? Absolutely. Feeling a lot better. We were a little congested last week, clearing <laughs> up a little bit this week. So that's always good. But no, the, the game was great. Cousin Cy, our, our favorite player, scored the fastest goal in team history. You counted it down 22 seconds. Yes, sir. Into the match. So that was pretty incredible. Way to establish right out the gate. Didn't last very long, unfortunately. We did get a second goal, but then within just, uh, I think, the first 12, 13 minutes, the Roots bounced back, and they had two goals as well. So that was kind of heartbreaking, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, ended up being 3-3 full-time. So still got our first point of the season in the NPSL. So that's huge, regardless of whether it be a against a club like the Florida Roots, who was playing their first game, or really anybody in the conference. We're on the same conference for a reason. So just excited to see them get out there and, and get a hard-fought point. It was great to see. Finally great to get a result, my man. Obviously, we were waiting for it. We were hoping for an exciting debut, exciting action. But we definitely got it. No shortage of action, no shortage of goals on Saturday, my man. Like you said, that was kind of the mantra coming into the game is, hey, guys, we want to come out full throttle. We're going to be press it. We're going to be getting after it. And, man, they were just at it from the start. And that's what you love to see. That was the philosophy. They went with the high press, and they were relentless. And it was kind of a situation that almost made me want to relate it as a big basketball fan, Trent, is just them going with like a full court press and just being like, hey, guys, we're going to empty the bench. And they did. Coach Bruno played all 18 of the active or eligible, I guess, would be kind of the more precise terminology, if you will, for the MPSL roster. Allowed the seven subs. He used them all, my man. So we saw everybody out there on Saturday that went ahead and made the trip for the team. Of course, this was the first road game, so it was an interesting venture to see how TSC would fare. A lot of the guys were excited about the road game, and of course, this was the first game ever for Florida Roots FC, and they were opening up their stadium, their first ever, of course, MPSL as well. And you know, a lot of firsts and a lot of excitement and a lot of festivity goes around that. The goal was, and everybody said it, we want to go into their house and we want to wreck shop. And like you said, it only took 12 touches of the ball and then uh, five passes that the Florida Roots were able to complete. And then the six paths, Johnny Fitzgerald, of course, just a big addition to the team just this past week. This was his first game, two practices with the team. And then he rolls into Saturday. He's like, all right, boys, let's do this thing. And uh, rips it off immediately. Perfectly paced ball. Like you said, to Cousin Cy, collect and rip. A two-touch goal, man. So it really only took, what, TSC four touches to get that bad boy in the back of the net after ripping it right around midfield, just outside the center circle. Clinical placement, like you said, 22 seconds into the game, fastest goal ever in TSC history. And we may have to delve into the MPSL record books, man, because 22 seconds is hard to beat, especially considering that the roots kicked off. So we had to go get the ball and dump it in. Um, But yeah, super impressive. That was great. And, you know, less than a minute in, as we said, on the front foot. So that was great. Philosophically, like we said, wanting to get on the front foot and wanting to impose our will 
on the road. So that was great to see. What are some other big thematic takeaways or kind of your pressing issues or your immediate thoughts? Because I know, obviously, just coming out of the weekend and just rewatching the game today, I know a lot of it's fresh. Um, so what are those kind of fresh hitters or those open wounds, Trent, is I think perhaps a more uh, comfortable phraseology, if you will, of what we got going on right now. Yeah, absolutely, Juke. So I think you mentioned it very well. The high press that DSC showed right out the gate was practiced a lot this week. You told me you were out there getting some interviews again and got to see firsthand the team implementing that press in practice. So that was really exciting to see them push right out the rip and and because of that pressure, get a goal nearly 20 seconds in. Like you said, we didn't even have the ball. So we were just applying pressure. Fitzgerald just read the diagonal pass, hopped in front of it, boom, plays Cy after a couple touches, and it's a goal. So that was huge. And they had that heavy press the entire match, I felt. They didn't really relent in that department. Nisimba, Levy Nisimba, one of the forwards for the team, was crucial in that department. He had a lot of balls that he won in the air. He had a header that just went over the crossbar was almost a goal. He had one headed down. It was the second goal that we had in the first couple minutes. And David Monroe, he flicked that in with his right foot, just right there in the six yard box. So he was very crucial in the attack and just winning possession for the team as a whole. But yeah, big picture for the game. I thought it was definitely a little chippy. Referee decided to swallow his whistle at times and call some stuff other times. So it was very interesting. I know we'll get into that a little bit later on as well, but yeah, kind of some head scratching calls that we saw that could have changed the outcome of the result for Tallahassee Soccer Club and could have possibly given us three points instead of just one. And it was definitely more than a little chippy. It got straight wild and a couple sequences almost straight broke out into some brawls, especially in the second half of that action. Yeah, you said some questionable calls swallowing the whistle. I think that's definitely terminology. For large parts of this game, I thought the officiating was tragic. Not to exaggerate, but for being realistic, Trent, I thought it completely dictated the game. Because that's one thing we talked about last week is, hey, you know, we felt like there were some missed calls, but there was some consistency. The referee said, hey, guys, we're going to let you play. And the players were able to adjust to that, and they were able to make adjustments, and we saw that play out. And the game never really got out of control because there wasn't a high temper level with that. The referee said, hey, handle it on the field, and the players handled it on the field. But here, it was just an absolute nightmare at times and it was inconsistent calls it was incompetence and just I just felt like on so many levels it just played a disservice to not only the players but just everybody there experiencing it and you never got into a flow and one of the reasons I think it got chippy is because the referee couldn't decide what was fouls what was not let it go play this and you see so many inconsistencies up and down that the players are getting frustrated, and so they can't go out and slide tackle the ref. So what they end up doing is they slide tackle the other team and maybe put a little extra meat on those challenges. And so it got very chippy, and we saw six yellow cards were recorded, Trent. But watching the game film, I know this is something we talked about. There was actually a seventh, I think, that was missed by the officiating crew. So there were actually... A yellow card that was not recorded. So we'll have to kind of log back and see if we can cut up that footage. It's a little tougher to rip that away footage than it is to get access to the home stuff that we have. But, dude, for large portions of that game, it was... And not just from a home team's perspective. I'm I'm trying to count similar circumstances where things were not called on us for the Florida Roots as well. Like, this is a two-way street. It was definitely favorable, it felt, towards the Florida Roots for sure. But... Oh my gosh, it was, as a person watching this game, dude, it was frustrating in that regard because if the officiating's bad and consistently bad and it's there for both teams, you know, you can make that adjustment or try to play to that, but when it's all over the place, there is no way to accommodate that, and you saw it, there didn't seem to be a rhythm of the game for either team, not to say that there wasn't good play, because there definitely was, and I thought we created a lot of chances and the linkage with the midfield to the attacking line felt a lot smoother than it was. I felt we were winning a lot more aerial balls. We had great build-up play, some construction that we were able to go through all levels of the field. I thought there were definitely some notable improvements, so we can't say that there was there was no flow to the game in that regard. 
But as far as having long, sustained durations of consistent play and just the ball staying in balance or without whistles and all that stuff, it was really difficult to get a long period of time where that kind of emerged. It was troublesome throughout, and it was it, it kind of added to the uncomfortable feeling. I was baffled. Baffled, confused, angered, all the above. Applied, man. Definitely a problem there. Yeah, Duke, definitely a problem to say the least. And baffled was certainly how I felt after seeing the penalty that was called on Drew Daunt in just the early minutes of the game. I think probably about five, six minutes into the match, the Battle Lions were actually up 2 nothing at that point after the Monroe and the side goal. So that was awesome. But Drew's going in, and it was kind of getting a little chippy down the sideline. Nothing was called. And then the defender, I'm sorry, the attacking player for the Florida Roots dribbles the ball into the box. And he was kind of double teamed, got past the guy that filled in for Daunt after he was originally beat. Daunt makes up the ground, cuts him off, goes shoulder to shoulder, and the Florida Roots player was just looking to go to ground. I mean, he was playing the ball. He went shoulder to shoulder. So I, I don't think there's really any way that that could be awarded a penalty. What about you, Jude? What did you think about that play? Yeah, it was pretty bang, bang. I mean, first of all, Daunt rocked him. There's no doubt about that, but just because he got rocked doesn't mean it's a foul necessarily. Like you said, going shoulder to shoulder, Daunt going after the ball. Daunt get, did get a piece of the ball. He was playing it back centrally, so I think a tough break. It wasn't as tragic as some calls, but obviously you can look to that. You could say, oh, bad call, boom, instant goal. So there's the correlation there. So, you know, you're not going to get an argument from me, but I definitely think there are some more egregious instances throughout this first half especially but definitely into the second half as well i got a feeling about the 33rd minute you have a specific instance a little uh goal kick corner kick controversy give me a little bit of that flavor because i know that's something that you talked about as well yeah if i'm not mistaken that was uh when cousin Sai got on the end of the ball i think there was a corner and it bounced around a little bit i believe it was on target keeper just does a little fingertip save is jumping backwards tips it right over the bar Totally should have been a corner. Got ruled as a goal kick. We lost possession. It's funny, I was watching the replay this afternoon, and the same celebration that Cy had for his goal, he just stood there and put his arms out. That's the same goal he had, but he's sprinting right at the referee trying to plead his case. Yeah, that was one that blew my mind, Trent. Like we said, 33rd minute I have in my notes. You know, the clock was a little off, so I wasn't sure if that was. But, yes, we had a little free kick and to set up this, this scenario. Fitzgerald rips it in, so Mike Zamora wins the first ball. Like you said, it goes up, and then Cy, like you said, heads it on frame, and it's going on target. It's going to go under the post. Goalie clearly grabs the bar. His other hand tips it up over the goal, and like you said, it was from about 10 yards out, clearly touched by the keeper. It was at least a ball and a half underneath the crossbar. So from the top of the crossbar, probably about a ball and a half, so obviously going to go in, but clearly tipped over, and the the referee just kind of looks around, and then he's just like, goal kick, (laughs) like he saw, like he kind of blacked out almost. He blacked out (laughs) for like that second and a half. He saw Cy contact it, and he saw a ball go over the net, but he just kind of blacked out right before the keeper touched it, and so he's just like, he looks over at the side ref, he's just like, well, looks like a goal kick. There we go. So, yeah, that was another instance that was just like, oh, my gosh. You know, a lot of these are judgment calls, but that's about as basic as it gets. One team touches the ball. Therefore, the other team gets to put it in. You know, we're not playing pickup where everything over the back line is going to be a goal kick. This is a legitimately semi-professional league. And so that was just another frustrating instance. So this is kind of a call to action, Trent. If we have anybody in the Big Bend or North Florida area, Quincy Officials Association, Big Bend Officials Association, anywhere else in North Florida, maybe even Jacksonville, and you are competent at refereeing soccer, why don't you go ahead and get yourself certified for the MPSL? Because after this game, we could definitely use some more qualified, competent officials, Trent, because I watched a couple high school games this year, and I did not see anything as tragic as that, Trent. So here for our locals official shout outs, but we could definitely use some more of those, my man. But yeah, just kind of playing back into that frustrating narrative is just like, what the heck is going on here? I would say the zebras, but they were wearing red there on Saturday, Trent. So there there wasn't really a clean, you know, I can't say the guys in red 
because then, you know, people could think, oh, yeah, one of the Florida Roots colors is like an orangish red. So I would try to offer any confusion there. But goodness gracious, man. But yeah, add it to the laundry list of the referee stuff. And we'll have some more stuff as we go forward for sure. But I guess any big extra egregious ones to stick out. Yeah, do you have another call that I think should have been made that wasn't was just a couple minutes after that, that free kick. Not, not quite a corner, but in the corner, I should say. He just drilled low and it trickled through. It was on goal. And as it is about to cross the face of the goal, a defender comes in, gets a touch to it, bounces up, hits the crossbar, bounces down inside the goal, and then it's cleared. And there was never even a second thought. The referee just never even noticed that either. Didn't even consider that it could have possibly been a goal, which would have put the battle lines up at that time. So, yeah, that was another big miss. And, and Fitzgerald immediately running over pleading his case, which we saw quite a few times happen on the night, not just with Fitzgerald, but with, you know, players on both sides. The referee seemed like he didn't even want to jog half the time. Just kind of <laughs> stood in the middle of the field looking around, <laughs> looking at the side refs to see what they thought. It was it was pretty remarkable, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Of course, the goal, no goal call. Yeah, that was probably about 35, 37 minutes. Once again, the clock was a little dicey and all we have access to is the away feed. So that's all we, that we can see. But yeah, absolutely, man. Of course, coming off the Johnny free kick, but the setup for that free kick. So you talked about the goal going in. But the reason that the free kick was awarded is because Johnny was just mauled out there on the perimeter. So that is probably my worst one when I'm thinking about the worst calls or anything else here. There's a couple other instances, but you talked about this one. And for the record, this can kind of seem like we're getting into an officials bashing segment, which we are. So all (laughs) that having said is you have access to the feed, and I... And we, Trent, if I can speak for you here briefly, would encourage you to watch back and make your own judgments, Trent, because we've both watched this game now wire to wire three times, and I've gone back and watched these highlights individually, depending on the play, depending on the situation, between five and ten times each. And so this is going back, looking at it again, looking at it again, looking at it again. But the setup for this 37th minute, we want to try to get these clips because you can see what's going on. But anyways... Back to the matter at hand, this Johnny situation for the goal, no goal situation. So in order to set this up, a yellow card was issued to the Florida Roots. But after a loose ball, I think it was after a chance, it was kind of a wild sequence. A long throw by Monroe gets into the box, blah, 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 blah. Florida Roots clear. Johnny gets on the ball. He's on the perimeter far side if you're watching the film. So our attacking side, we're going left to right because it's the first half. And he's in front of the team. So by the Florida Roots bench, kind of. But definitely on the other side from the crowd or where the camera is. So he just breaks this dude's ankles. Number 20, I think Liam Kearns, if I'm reading the depth chart right. So he's burdened this fool. And the guy reaches out and grabs his waist. Like he's an American football player. Not like a football player, but like an American football player, Trent. And legitimately is like a linebacker. And Johnny's like a running back. And he just tries to bring him down. But Johnny legit shakes through it like a good running back, and eludes him, breaks the tackle, nothing called there. And then this other guy, number two, comes in for Florida Roots, clean slide, he gets all ball and clears it. The referee calls the foul on the second interaction, the tackle, the second tackle, if you will. Of course, we've got an American football tackle and a soccer tackle here in this little sequence. So number two, yellow card, but while the while the cards are being dished out, the guy that arm tackle Johnny runs across the field and goes to guard uh, somebody I think he goes to guard Levy on the other side of the box the referee doesn't even see him leave he cards the guy that just had the regular clean tackle and the other guy who legit non-soccer play we talked about that last week is like a keyword a non-soccer infraction that not only should have been a yellow card but I mean you're looking at red card territory when you're legitimately tackling people like that or attempting to people tackle about that because you see this guy lose his feet because Johnny shakes him so bad and then his upper body is what turns around and grabs him but oh my gosh and the referee's just like oh yeah you come over here and so number two ends up picking up the yellow card and that's in the official scorebook and and number 20 just kind of slides out of there see you later and then so that leads into that goal no goal situation you talked about and it's just like oh my gosh but that was just absolutely brutal there before the half because at this point the roots are up 3-2 so this potentially could have made it 3-3 of course we'll go back and actually look how 
you know, there could have been another penalty kick in the mix for TXC, which would have been put it on level terms. So this would have technically given it the lead. So I remember when we were kind of thinking back, we always reference it at 3-3 as halftime because that's what it should have been with this no goal goal situation that went down around the 35-37 minute. But yeah, what were your thoughts on that, the tackle slash yellow card, the build up to the free kick? Because I know you talked about the goal going in, but I mean, that wasn't anywhere close to a soccer play on that far side, man. No, absolutely not. I think he covered it pretty well. He just was totally grabbing him, you know, trying to bring him to ground using his arms, which is obviously not really allowed in this game. So yeah, definitely a yellow could have even been a straight red. But speaking of some straight reds that were missed, I mean, there was another one. I was looking at your notes that you had for today, and in all caps, you said, should have been a red card. And so I immediately went back and watched the replay. And yeah, I mean, Peralta just got wrecked. Number 14, Vidal for the Florida Roots just came in. Peralta had already sent the ball away, just came in late and just wrecked him. And Peralta just flipped over on his back. I mean, did like a full somersault, if you will. It was just remarkable. The ref was not even that far away at that point and didn't even look at it, didn't even think twice about that play. Could have easily been a straight red, nowhere near the ball at all. I mean, and that's before the half. So talking about another instance where we could have gone to 3-3 in the first half, I mean, we could have gone a man down and easily got another goal in those last five minutes. That was another one that was just mind-bottling there is in the middle of the field just after Cole Red gets subbed on. So like we said, once again, if you're on the time, about 40 minutes. TSC throw, Mike gets it in, and then the ball gets centered. I think it's Peralta, number 14, that was going after. But yeah, like you said, 11 undercuts him. He's on his back, on his shoulder, and he literally jolts up and flips him over his back. Like we said, ball is gone. He never got a piece of the ball. It was never a bang-bang play. It was gone, and then bam, hit, and then flip. And he just gets rocked. Ref doesn't even give it a second thought, doesn't even look at him, no advantage sign, no nothing. And there was no consideration. I think it should have been a red card. I think this was worse than the Johnny tackle, to be honest, just with the severity of it and how it went down. But that was brutal as well. Once again, 40th minute, right in front of the referee. This was just on our side of the field. So this was right in the area of the center circle is where this all goes down. And it's just, I just can't get it. I just don't. How do you see that go down? That's like that's like a WWE. I don't know the name of it. A suplex. Yeah, it's like a Statue of Liberty suplex smackdown. And <laughs> evidently, Florida Roots, you know, coach must have been doing some WWE hype videos before the game because these guys are just all over the place but or maybe they had you know best college football hits or something NFL hits going on and trying to relive these out on the soccer field but goodness gracious dude definitely something we can belabor the point Trent but you know as we get 20-ish minute referee rant if you will you know definitely a pro rant podcast for the record and we encourage anybody that's hitting the mailbag or listening to email in tallyscetalk at gmail.com. We'd love to get your rant, um, you know, within reason. If it gets too ridiculous, you know, we're going to have to chop it up a little bit. Be ready with that uh, sensor, Trent. YouTube only lets you get away, or these podcast host sites only let you get away with so much. Yeah, man, that was ridiculous, but we want to beat this dead horse a little more, Trent, get in on these referees, or or should we uh, change change yeah. the mode a little bit? Because, I, hey, I'm not necessarily ending it, man. If you've got more horse to beat, I say you go at it. I'll give you another bat. I got one more until the horse is dead, in my opinion, go and that him. would be... Just to backtrack a little bit, I forgot. There was one about 22, 23 minutes in where Drew Dalton won the ball, chested it down inside of the box, and then number 14 for the Roots, he took down Daunt, came in, stepped on his back heel after Daunt had clearly won possession and was controlling the ball, was going to make a second move, it came in from behind and got his heel. I mean, at that point, I think, yeah, it was 2-2, so that could have given us a penalty, taken us into the lead. Just a few minutes later, the 26th minute, that's when the Roots got their third goal. So, I mean, that could have changed everything. We could have been up 3-2 instead of, you know, being down 3-2. And, I mean, that kind of messed up Drew Daunt a little bit, I felt like. But, yeah, we saw Daunt get subbed off at half because of that foul or not. But, yeah, he was definitely shaky getting up. And, again, just a complete no call by the ref. I mean, <laughs> it's just immaculate how often these players went to ground, got crushed, and he didn't even think twice about it. Yeah, because, I mean, that's not something that happened. You saw how the play was developing, and, 
you know, it wasn't a go to ground situation. It would be more valuable the way that the play was progressing to continue on and rip that. Just like Johnny. When Johnny was getting tackled, he didn't go down when that guy was legit trying to arm tackle him. He was fighting through that. And seeing Daunt play and the physicality and knowing, I mean, this is a tough dude. They just take him down. They sweep the back leg. It was like a karate kid situation. A couple karate kid moves out there. So he swept the leg. He goes down. Once again, he had complete control of the ball, too. This wasn't like a 50-50 ball, and a, he was diving at it, and a couple other guys were diving at it. He had legitimately chested it down in his radius and getting ready to make a second touch. Guy comes in. Guy does not get the ball. Once again, no piece of the ball because Daunt has touched it another time and made his second touch, and the ball once again is gone. Bam. Sweeps a leg down once again. No call. And yeah, he was legit hurt. I mean, he was limping. You know, he soldiered through it for 20 more minutes. Like we said, we don't know for sure if that had to do or was more strategic the way uh, he helped out. But yeah, I'm glad you uh, gave a shout out to Corey Osga because he definitely helped out a lot coming back. Knowing that Daunt was dinged up, he's like, yo, I got to cover this the way this game is going. (laughs) He said, I got to be back there. So good on him for that. Playing to that bigger narrative of how this team works together and some great stuff. But once again, dude, what is going on over there? The zebra's in red. Yeah, at that point it was 2-2, but yeah, add it to the list of grievances. Maybe need to submit this tape to the MPSL, man. Maybe have to review this one. I don't know how those chain of commands work, but I'm interested to see when we get out there and talk to the boys what the perception is. But definitely a disconnect here in rules, consistent refereeing, and what was seen out in Panama City on Saturday, May 8th, 2021. Trent will come out of the big picture. Let's go to a little game recap. Obviously, you talked about Cousin Sai. Who we talked about in you know, relation to the program. If you are in the dark about what that is, you got to go check out episode two, baby. We'll get you all up to date on Cousin Cy from here on out, Trent. But yeah, man, let's take it back. You said TSC record, 22 seconds in to start the game. So back from the kickoff, got the quick steal. Fontenot put it in the net. Beautiful fast from Fitzgerald. Just a gorgeous sequence. That little snapshot right there. So that puts TSC one nothing on the road. Complete control. Where are we after that? Yeah, after that, in the fourth minute, we had a corner. Schmilker was on the corner on the near side. He sent it in, great ball. He had a lot of great services the entire match. As he put it onto Levy Nisimba's head, he won the ball, headed it down perfectly to David Monroe, the center back, who pushes up for a lot of the set pieces. He's got a lot of height. And, yeah, right place, right time, just was kind of right there, almost on the line, and just used the outside of his right foot to flick it into the goal real quick and, just after that side goal, three minutes later, we're up 2 nothing in Panama City. Boom, there you go. And kind of a side editor's note. Heard Chris on an interview this week with local radio station, and he said he believes he is David Monroe, of course, with that second goal, was the youngest player ever to score in TSC history. So we're going to check the book. So unofficially, we're going to anoint David as the youngest goal scorer ever to put one in for TSC. 18 years 101 days for those of you count at home. So we talked to David last week, and we have it on tape. So check episode two, part three, interrogations of interest. David Monroe said, I'm going to get me one this season. And then boom, Trent, three days later, he's ripping one in the back of the net. So TSC up 2 nothing, man. So we're rolling. At this point, we are four or five minutes into this ball game, and we're straight cruising, man. It looks like we're going to be scoring a goal every 10 minutes. We're on pace to put 45. It's going to be a 45 nothing shutout, and we're pretty much set on goal differential for the rest of the season. Trent, that puts us at a plus 44 goal differential if we're able to keep that pace. So it's looking pretty good for us. But the pace slows down a little bit. The narrative has changed, is it not? Yeah, unfortunately it was in the sixth minute. That's when Daunt came in with that challenge, and it was deemed a penalty kick. So Andrew Beasley, number seven for the Roots, scores their first ever goal. That could have gone without being called at all. Unfortunately, the ref, the Red Zebra, saw it differently and called it a penalty kick. And yeah, it was 2-1 after six minutes there. Yeah, so it bounced back, but still a furious amount of goals, Trent. I mean, we're six minutes into this ball game, and once again, you're trying to dial up that pace. We're still having a goal every two minutes at this pace, so still on pace for uh, 45 goals. At that point, TSC was scheduled to win 30-15 to 15 if we were able to keep that pace. So once again, putting the goal differential back at plus 14, 
I mean, you gotta like that, my man. So that did not continue. We talked about a couple more sequence of events, some handballs not getting called after that, going through here, but consistent attack from TSC. Not like we got the two goals and then we kind of sat back trying, as you said earlier, is this was one thing they were on at the high press was here. It wasn't as intense as it was the first couple minutes, but they were going after balls. They were trying to cut off the angles and this was a consistent, let's put the pressure on them, see how, see if they can handle it. And that was something that the success, I think they did very, very well as far as consistent throughout the game, pressure in the box, whether it's a cross through the box, whether it's a big throw from Monroe. I like that, by the way, big throw from Monroe and just some other chances that they're able to generate through the midfield. Like we talked about it, I think vastly improved from week one, Trent, and just seven days later, seeing that improvement in this ball game, I think was very uplifting. And so that continued, but then, of course, after one of those clearances off a counter, Florida Roots came back, long throw, it gets into the box, it's just one of those weird situations where it gets in and then it starts hitting bodies, boom, next thing you know, somebody's got a right foot, and they bury it in. So it was Bradley who gets credit with the goal, you know, one of the guys we talked about in the bonus episode, I think of episode two, one of those two big names for the Roots going forward so then that ties it up at 2-2 man so we're 12 minutes in we've seen four goals into the net already and man it was just kind of disappointing because at least to me I felt like our goals were calculated precise and solid looking goals and to me you know, not that it matters, but it, it felt a little cheap on the other end. Man, we had these strong two goals, feeling confident, and then boom, it's instantly erased. But you got to snap in, you got to refocus, you can't make excuses, and you can't change the past. So we're back to level pegging, and then we keep on rolling. So we fall off a little bit of the pace, it's not at every two or three minutes for some goals going forward, but it was kind of a disappointing sequence a little bit later. Once again, talking into the yellow cards and all this other stuff, 17th minute. Once again, ridiculous call. Monroe gets carted up, clean tackle, gets the deflection on the ball. The player has an opportunity to jump over Monroe or jump around Monroe, but he kind of does the old drag of the foot, Trent, and really kind of laboriously goes on his pace after the slide had been made. And so yellow card for Monroe gives him a free kick, but luckily nothing really comes of it they get a shot on frame but oscar's there solid save good positioning so you know i guess kind of ball don't lie if you want to take some solace in that trend things equaled out as they didn't really get a good chance but we continued on and and that it's kind of pushed us through the the first 20 minutes so it's just a roller coaster man it was so up and down because we turn on the feed and then all of a sudden boom side puts one in oh my gosh then we got the corner another one dave just puts one in and so we're rolling. We're like, oh my gosh, we're going to wreck these fools. It's going to be like 16 nothing. And then they snap back with two. And so, you know, back to reality. Oh yeah, this is a semi-professional soccer team. These are quality guys and they're here to play. They're not here to get buried. And so credit the Florida Roots with that. It's tough getting out of two nothing deficit, man. They snap back into it early first half and we're back on level pegging. Where were some thoughts or some developments once the game was back to level? Right about that post 12 minute mark going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that we still played well. Like in the 20th minute, Fitzgerald had an insane dribbling move where he kind of just like snaked the ball in between two defenders, took a quick touch with his left, right, boom, boom, and was just by him. So, I mean, the, the pace of play didn't let up at all. I mean, we were still coming out the 23rd minute. That's when Drew Daunt went down and could have won that penalty. So could have easily bounced back right after that second goal from the Florida roots, but unfortunately didn't. So that took us up through the 25 minute with the water break still 2-2. As a whole, I thought that the play was was consistent, was keeping up with the, the first four or five minutes there when we got the two goals, just couldn't squeeze a couple more out. And then uh, after the first water break there, it was a throw right outside the attacking third for the Florida roots, our defensive third. And just a really good throw into the box. I think Oscar got a, a hand on it and it fell down. And then uh, number nine for the Florida Roots. Left foot, body over the ball, just textbook finish, rips it, top of the net, right down the middle. That was a, a little demoralizing, you know, coming right out of the water break. Everybody's just trying to find their man, match up, and then boom, another goal in the back of the net. 
Yeah, true. So then you're going into the deficit, but going back to Vic Gerald move, that was so nasty, dude, because that was a two-on-one situation. He had one guy that was pursuing him from the back, and he cuts into the side of the field, just like with a little left-right or right-left. I forget exactly what order, but just burns both of these guys, and that was just a phenomenal soccer play in the vacuum. Just to speak to a larger hole, like you talked about, Trent, this team attacking going forward, looking solid on the front foot with the pressure and a really joined up unit. I felt like it was a a really solid unit approach here for TSC. And they, they really kind of stuck to those lanes, stuck to those roles and everybody really fed off each other really well. As this is something we can kind of backtrack, I guess, is we might've breezed through it a little bit, but once again, as far as a starting formation, zooming out the lens a little bit, going to a big picture I love the starting lineup and the flow of personnel that Coach put out here because this is an increasingly harder and harder and harder task. We talked about it just with the goalkeepers, but as people come back into the fold and battling out in practice and different game approaches, is that is so tough, man. And you have all these guys, quality guys that we know and can see, can play, and talented guys and coaches having to make these decisions time and time again. But we come up with a 4-5-1. He puts Levy up top as a sole striker. And then we come down in the midfield. You got Sai on the wing, on the left wing. Left center, mid, I guess you can say, would be Schmoker. And then you had you had Wimberley in the middle of the midfield. And then you had Johnny as almost a right center mid. Corey Oz go down on the right wing. And then you go back, flat four. We got some more Peralta, Monroe, Daunt right to left and obviously Oscar and goal who had a phenomenal week at practice and goal he had a super awesome diving like a slow motion save on Thursday but loved his aggressiveness and gets to start out here but I mean I really love the flow of that starting lineup kind of going back since we got to the water break and we're able to press pause what are your thoughts did you have any thoughts on the 11 I thought that the addition of Johnny Fitzgerald having him back from Akron I thought he tied the midfield together with the forward. The symbol was considered the only forward, but, you know, you had Osgood and Cy out wide. It could be kind of argued as we're wingers as opposed to outside mids, but that's just pedantics. Anyhow, um, I thought that he connected just the team, the, the midfield to the attack very well, and, and he had a really good touch. He reminded me a little bit of Bittencourt, who we saw in the second half of the first match. Just had some kind of quick touches, could just find an open teammate with a real quick one-two pass. I thought that his play with Cy in particular kind of stood out. I mean, he was who assisted Cy on the first goal, and they definitely had a lot of chemistry throughout the rest of the match, playing balls back and forth to each other. So I thought having him there was huge, probably the, the biggest change or improvement, I guess I could say, from the, the first match to the second was the addition of Fitzgerald. And then other than, other than that, I would probably say having Nisimba up top as the main forward. He came in, I think, with Ramsden. Well, I mean, he played the full match the first game, but he moved up top with Ramsden after they put Nick on in the first match as a substitute. They had two forwards, but right out the gate, we saw Levy Nisimba start as the number nine this match. And I thought that he just had a little bit more flair, a little bit more speed, charisma, if you will. But he just kind of fueled the attack, I felt. And there was one time where there was a ball that was sent in. can't remember if it was off a free kick or off just a cross. Obviously, you know, watching these games as many times as we have now, it's all kind of running together. But there was one play where Levy just kind of got loose in the box for a second. And I don't remember if he took it with his left or, or his right, but he went near post on the far side and just missed it. I think that would have tied it 3-3 in the first half. So he was a catalyst the entire match, getting involved with the attack and got the assist to David Monroe or, you know, actually taking the shots themselves. I thought they really thrived in the roles that they were played in during this match. Yeah, and that's another thing is not only these guys coming back, Trent, but just the synergy of this team because these are players, a lot of them playing different positions that they have in the past or during the year for college, rec, high school, wherever they may have been, and growing as a team and seeing, oh, this is the direction we're going. This is the goal coach wants. Because the players are still trying to figure out coach. Coach is trying to figure out the players. The players are trying to figure out each other. So there's just so many moving parts. And 
you know, as they continue to synergize, and I guess you could say this for every team, really, that they'll get better throughout the season, and everybody's going to have guys coming back. But for this team especially, just that jump forward to this week gets me really excited about what the future can hold, and we can get into this a little later in the week, maybe, or another episode or another segment that we get into as we look forward to next week, but at least here and now, you know, this is just a growing experience and growth all over, but yeah, like you said, solidification of the midfield for sure, and just a cohesive unit, and everybody really gelling together, and like we said, full 18-man participation, so everybody got in the mix, legitimately everybody that was on the active roster played a part in this success and can have a stake in that and I think this guns blazing mentality this high press this pressure situation that coach put up I don't know if we'll see this every week to this extent but I loved it like I said it was like a basketball press we're gonna throw tons of bodies at you guys are gonna get in low ego burn out and be able to let the next guy in knowing that they're gonna keep up this pressure and we saw that sustained through the match all the way zero to nine legitimately zero to 90 minutes of pressure and i think that was a positive takeaway from here but yeah kind of snapping back just after the water break trent like you said as we zoom in once again just after the water break another one very similar to the second goal just that weird throw in that gets bounced around and boom it gets put in unfortunately so they get the advantage and so man four minutes into the game we're up two nothing rolling you snap forward 20-25 minutes later now we're down a goal 3-2 and so that's a psychological issue having to get over but once again pressing forward keep it on rolling and there were time and time leading up to halftime that the pressure was on from that 25 minute mark to the last 20 minutes of that to get to the 45 at the break that I mean it was full metal man there was a couple free kicks that we had like we talked about That Johnny situation where he shakes through the tackle, the goal that should have gone in, which would have made it a 3-3. We talked about the Daunt play that could have potentially been a PK. PKs aren't automatic, but very high percentage, of course. You talked about the incidents with the yellow cards and the infractions of the red cards that could have potentially resulted in ejection. And, you know, this isn't in a a list of excuses or what ifs or what could have happened. And we obviously realize it's a TSC Homer podcast, but once again, want to approach it with some relatability and a mean and average and perspective. These are all things that are on the table. You can't full bodily embrace them as an excuse and say, this is why it didn't happen. But at the same time, it was a factor and you can't ignore these elements. And obviously, big scapegoat here as a referees is of course we continue to unpack that and continue to add on to that pile but it's something that can't be ignored and regardless going to the break man down three two anything else in the later stages of the first half you were excited about concerned about feel we, we need to unpack a little bit yeah just one last thing that i had and that was right there in the 28th minute drew don had i put an immaculate clean slide Right outside the box, unfortunately, it was called a free kick. So I, I just thought that that was kind of unfortunate. I thought that that was another great play that just got negated by poor officiating. Not to not to go back to the dead horse or anything, but it really stood out to me. I thought that that was really unfair to Drew, as well as the penalty and on both ends, actually, the one that he should have earned and, and unfortunately gave up. So just a really tough 45 minutes for Don, but just a workhorse defensively. I mean, pushing up, helping out in the attack. He was in the attacking third inside the box multiple times as he was in the first match. And so he played a lot of midfield at McClay. He just graduated from, but um, yeah, just an incredible defender, I think, for the Battle Lions. Yeah, off of that slide that was called a penalty, they got a really good free kick look. I forget who it was that was taking the kick for them. I think it was Lorenzi, number 10, guy that seemed to be kept making trouble for us. And he rips it and has very close on the near post. That had some whip to it and it never got on frame, but... That was a dangerous one. It almost made you think that the Roots were watching some serious film because it almost seemed, and you talked about Drew had a rough 45, them going after him and and a lot of other stuff. It made it seem like Levy and Daunt were marked men, Trent. They were two guys we need to take care of or we need to kind of chop down a peg because, like you were saying, man, just some periods of time, like these guys were getting lit up and fouled and 
elbowed and kneed and crushed and kicked and taken down to the ground and all of this other stuff. And of course, the the different calls that went around them too didn't help. But man, these two guys are brutalized. And like you said, Drew, but of course, I think Levy's in the mix as well. And going back to the Jacksonville game, even then, he was getting attacked and chopped down at the Jacksonville game too, because I think they didn't really have much of an answer for him. Something the coach said and kind of highlighted the the week after that. But man, those were two guys, like I said, just were see market for whatever reason. They had it coming, you know, for no fault of their own, nothing that they did, but they were getting it, man. They were going after it and getting it. All that to say is we go down 3-2 of the break once again. <laughs> And that is the halftime whistle. So that's going to do it all for part one here, the Tally SC Talk podcast on behalf of Andrew Jupe and Trent Young. Thanks for coming aboard with us. Make sure you like, subscribe, notify, whatever you have to do or whatever they do on those social medias, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Tally SC Talk to get the notification for the next episode. Make sure you come right on back. But until then, take care.